Project Lawful aka Plane Crash by Arwain, aka Eliezer Yudkowski and Lin Tamande. What the Truth Can Destroy, Episode 151. Security brings their report. The version judged almost certainly safe for senior staff to read says that Keltham had introduced a mental technique for ceasing self-deception, and Peranza had gotten stuck on the idea it'd take effect when she used Owl's wisdom. She did so, and had some kind of total collapse from accumulated strain over how much she was self-deceiving. She tried to mentally retreat into Alter Peranza, which didn't work either, and then while flailing around mentally cast Fox's cunning, and ended up hitting on Biadathilani from Keltham's stories. Security acknowledges this doesn't sound like a reasonable thing that would reasonably happen, but they haven't got anything better. Then she decided a Dathalani from Keltham's stories would betray the project immediately for Iomedi, and did that. That's so unsatisfying. Why are humans so terrible? All right, if there's a way to make it safe, I want a security to talk to her, to see if it's contagious, and for that matter, if it's permanent. And then we kill her. Some instinct wanted to end that sentence with, I guess, but she stops herself. Obviously, then they kill her. That's the obvious thing to do. There's no reasonable case for doing any other thing. She only undermines herself, sounding like she's in doubt. I'm frankly not seeing how to make it safe. Not in a way that doesn't consume Hell's intervention budget or a miracle diamond. She's not upset about sending Peranza to Hell. She's genuinely not. But... But she's not going to become a devil there. Hell can't fix her. Abigail warned them that all this niceness had a flip side, that if they betrayed the project, then they'd hurt forever, even if that wasn't profitable for their owners, even if it was a waste. So Peranza shouldn't have done that. Should she have? You can't not follow through on a commitment like that once you've made it. If anything, that means people will force your hand more often. Maybe Carissa was too nice, and that's why this happened. Right, then... I have a supposedly extremely urgent delivery of a cookie to the Chosen, along with the message, you don't have to order that yourself, he's already here. Who, Asmodeus? Is Carissa's first incredibly stupid thought. Her second thought is to be annoyed that someone thinks she can't handle being a cruel, tyrannical Asmodean, which is her entire job here. Uh, who's here? Gorthoklek, Hell's young master, Yarwain. That entity is one I find to be of increasing concern, especially given that it seems to be evading a direct meeting with myself. The dusk-skinned, white-eyed, eight-foot-tall armored man probably doesn't look particularly familiar to anyone here, but if you've heard General Gorthoklek talking before, it's very clear whose voice that is. Carissa will kneel with considerably more terror than she feels at Unexpected Abigail. Unexpected Abigail happens often enough to practically be expected. Senior devils do not. My yol more falls than kneels. He's got some trauma. I am well capable of preventing Iomadai from seeing into one of our lord's temples. I cannot interrogate this one or report on her to you. That is outside my limited remit in this place. If it is not a matter of slaying mortals to prevent the spread of a dangerous idea from beyond, but I can protect her interrogation from enemy eyes. And slay her after, I suppose, if that Caden spawn seems to believe you should not do that. It has not visibly betrayed our lord as yet, and the logic is obvious enough for how that deed might hamper your corruption of Keltham, if you must face him knowing that you yourself slew one of his... That doesn't sound quite right, as an articulation of why it'd interfere between Carissa and Keltham. It feels like something that'd stand between them even if overall Keltham came around on evil. She is not going to argue the point with Gorthoclek. Can you monitor the interrogator also and kill them if that needs doing? Otherwise, I am deeply unsure who to assign that job. Yes. Make no wasteful haste about this matter. But do not dawdle about it either. My time is valuable. Right. I think, not a barco. The idiot security who fucked this up in the first place can question her, see if we get any more than we did from the original mind read. And then, if he survives that intact but doesn't learn much, we can send in a barco. 
She does not want to make any motions towards not kneeling, but she'll get a message off to this effect. Peranza opens her eyes, chained in an Asmodean temple, facing one of the newer and lesser security set to monitor the likes of herself. She is not as wise now, not as intelligent, but she remembers who she now is, remembers what she did, and it's only now, in fact, that the actual thought occurs to her of what she did. And all the screaming horror and terror in her gets crushed down in sheer reflex, because that's what she does all the time. It's probably what Mielsvor would do. There must be some perfectly reasonable reason that she made the right decision. She was smart then. It's probably because Ilani don't yield to threats, so that must be the right way to be. What's done is done. She has to play this out, has to hope, because she literally can't get any more fucked. But she is an Ilani now, who dares to grasp and use their techniques. The minds around her are lesser ones. They do not know themselves. Dare not know themselves as she knows them. The flaws in them. All the more convenient if they're reading her mind. That means they'll know that she speaks true. She looks at the security before her and reasons in a flash, because there's no time and maybe no safety in reasoning in more detail than that. She guesses from the absence of terrorizing in his demeanor that would be present if this one was here to terrorize her and hadn't recently screwed up. That this one is the one who screwed up. It's not a certainty, but an Ilani thinks in probabilities even when they're not thinking in numbers. You're probably due for quite a lot of punishment for letting me do that, Peranza says out loud. You do not, in fact, need to let them hurt you. It is not, in fact, the correct decision for you to tolerate that. Asmodeus is not something that any human being should ever serve. You have your own will, your own wants, and civilization can make you a better offer. You, anyone who's listening. Come with me. Take me and Keltham from this place, and after a long life filled with beauty and all the humanity that was denied you, you can be a statue for a time. Until civilization in this world has brought hell to heal, as it will do. As I know, because I dare to think, now, and use the law your superiors are too scared to use, because they know they can't handle the truth. Feel free to truth spell me about any of that, or read my mind. Is that really what you thought, he says? that you'd escape, that Keltham will leave, that you'll never have to go to hell. Because, you know, honestly, I'm going to be embarrassed on your behalf, putting that in the report of why you defected. It's very, very delusional. It can be fixed in everyone else by just telling them, truthfully, that they're not going to escape, and Keltham's not going to turn on the project, not on his precious riches and his precious girls he can hurt and his precious sense that he picked the right side to hand the keys to world domination. She openly laughs. No bluff. It's real. If that was true, they'd just tell him now. False. And know that you will not be able to deceive an Alani. Or, if you actually believe that, read my mind or truth spell me so you know how honest I am in fact being. See that I know when I say that Keltham will turn on the project the moment he learns. Giving up his sense that he picked the right side, he won't even hesitate. He taught us that in his class. Were you not there that day? The art of just saying oops and getting it over with? Isn't it wonderful? There's an incredibly powerful new form of thought that no Asmodean can wield and remain Asmodean. It's just false that it's in our best interest to serve a horrible god and go to hell and get tortured. It's just false that we don't have any better options. Everyone in Lastwall and in Osirion will be able to learn it with no problems. Cheliax is doomed. Keltham himself couldn't hand them the keys to world domination if he tried, and he is trying, not knowing that it's impossible, because, it turns out, this is what happens when somebody actually does grasp those keys. You are not on the winning side. But you could be. Or hurt me. And my civilization will come for you even in hell to avenge me. Think on that if you yield to threats. And if you don't, then what are you even doing here? Be more afraid of rising civilization than falling hell. Or throw aside all your fears and join us. It's the right decision either way. No one else who Keltham's put through his extra special keeper training seems to be having any trouble. Just you. 
Why'd you see it when they didn't? She smiles again. Somebody had to be first, that's all. I don't buy it. I'm not interested in learning all the Dathilan stuff. I've been tuning half of it out. But I've picked up some things, and I don't buy that you think you defected to the winning side. Should I put it in a Dathilani kind of way? Some Paranzas are stuck in a world where Yomide's a poser, and her countries are at their limits holding on to the world wound and could spare no one for a war with Cheliax, even if they thought it was as urgent as that and could spare only a few units if they thought it was more important than that. And where Abadar is down to negotiate with us so Osirion won't stand in our way, or where they try, and we flatten them. Cheliax is making spell silver much, much cheaper than anyone else, as you kindly tried to tell Yomed, eh, though it doesn't look like it worked. The headband assembly line is what? A few weeks from working? And then Savar can do the same thing for items with military applications. And those are the things I happen to know about from following the reject whores who signed up for special keeper training. I don't think they're all the real project has going. Some Paranzas, most Paranzas, I'd argue, but let's go with some Paranzas. Live in a world where hell's gonna win and they're gonna spend the rest of eternity paying for that one try at letting good know what's coming. And you have no idea how Cheliax and Osirian stack up militarily, or how many soldiers Yomedea commands, or whether the secret thing that made the war with Nidal go so fast for us will be replicated. So there's no way you sized up some facts you knew and decided you were on the winning side. I don't know why you did it, but that's not why. You've got one deceived Alani showing you a few simple tricks they teach to nine-year-olds. Because he hasn't figured out the lie yet, as he inevitably will once he has enough evidence. He may get it the morning I don't show up for class. Osarian and Lastwall will have thousands of Ilani. You weren't around back when Keltham showed us the results. They have a radiance device that can lift things into space with light alone, that could burn clear through any castle in Galarian in seconds from ten miles away and that wasn't even a weapon to them. Cheliax won't have that. Keltham himself doesn't know how to make it. That takes thousands of Alani working together to deduce and then build, and that's something Cheliax can never, ever have. There will not be a war with Cheliax. There will be a rescue operation on Cheliax. Again, you did not think through any of that before you decided to try to get Iomide's attention, and you do not know a bunch of facts that are relevant to whether it's true. Like, can we just crush them both tomorrow before they get the chance to benefit from any of that? So what were you actually thinking? Why are you acting like you need me to say it in order for you to know? If you don't have Detect Thoughts prepped, can I politely suggest that you go requisition a scroll or a staff of it? I'm sure Stores has some, and this will go better if you know I'm being honest. No one's taking suggestions of any kind from the crazy bitch who was the only person on Project Lawful who couldn't take it. You know why this happened to you, right? It's because, after Pilar had her breakdown about how to reconcile Asmodeanism and being Dathilani, her big revelation was that she'd been too unwilling to be cruel, so she told Sevar that the rest of you should be put through this. I kind of figure some will break like you, some will break like her. What an interesting thing for cruelty to suggest. Was snack service possibly involved? Thanks for that valuable information. Peranza doesn't say that part out loud. If this annoying idiot insists on not reading her mind, he can just get to not hear about it then. So it takes slightly more law to finish breaking someone who literally came back from Elysium, who now doesn't dare to go on learning until Keltham has tried to teach some more disposable subjects, in the hopes that one of those somehow won't break. So Pilar Pineda, pet of Aspexia Rugaton, can learn from them how she can be an Ilani safely. It's not even slightly going to work, I know now, but I suppose you'll have to rely on sense motive to believe me about that, if you don't have detect thoughts or a truth spell. Have you got any arguments for why it isn't going to work, that aren't appeals to military information you don't have? This would in fact be easier to explain if you'd tried to pick up the material on Ilanism while it was being taught. You're coming at this from the wrong angle. You have no idea what an Ilani can deduce. That thing Keltham does? that you should have been warned about by Asmodia, where you say something that sounds ordinary and innocent to you, and Keltham makes some far-reaching deduction using laws you don't understand. Not only can I do it too, now, but I realize that I'd been doing a lot of it already. Asmodeans just train themselves not to know they're doing it, which is how I was able to know what I knew right away, without taking a lot of extra time to think. 
For example, among the military information you think I don't have, I'd ask how you think you even know what information I have, but you'd have to be an Alani to realize why. How do I even know that is an important question. Is a conversation between Savar and the Queen of Cheliacs. Back when the Queen and the Most High were taking tea with the rest of us, a couple of days after Keltham made his hiring decisions. Asmodia asked if she could have female wizard students from outside Cheliacs to examine kidnapped ones. Sevar mentioned that Philandriel Morgethai's university was the reason we don't own Andoran, and that the Magisterium in Absalom is the reason nobody's ever conquered it. You aren't allowed to think about what that implies about the relative military strength of Cheliacs. Or, rather, you're not allowed to think of it in words. A part of yourself that you can't see, but an Alani can, reads ahead to what the results would be if you did think about it, and it warns off the part of yourself exposed to detect thoughts from thinking anything that sounds disloyal. But that part of you has to know what you would deduce to warn you off from that. If I say now that all the students at Morgathai's University and Absalom's Magisterium will have a far easier time of picking up everything Keltham's trying to teach, because they're not afraid of seeing truths like that, some part of you is flinching right now. And for that part of yourself to know to flinch, it must already know what you'd deduce if you let yourself look. That's why I was able to know immediately what the real truth of the matter was, as soon as I stopped not looking there. My mind had already calculated it. And now that I've said that much to you, you will, inevitably, start to see it yourself at some point, which is why they picked a disposable low-ranking security officer for this interview instead of putting a barco on it. You're definitely going to need to flee Cheliacs at some point. That part is inevitable. Part of you already knows that, which is why you can feel yourself flinching away from thinking of it right now. You're making a pretty compelling case that if your deductions are true, and not just making random assumptions and declaring them Dathilani, we'd better kill Keltham as soon as we have to let him go which I assume the people in charge of that have already thought about. I don't buy that you calculated the real and inevitable truth instead of just leaping to some random, convenient conclusions, though. But I believe you believe you did, which is disappointing. I'll have to report that you really just delusionally convinced yourself everyone is as weak as you, Cheliax is doomed. Keltham will build an Ilani civilization spanning all our neighbors, and will for some reason not be able to do anything about that, including letting the demons eat them. Like, will totally happen if we redeploy our forces, and... Actually, that's insufficient. Even if all that happens, you'll be in hell being tortured forever. Is it that much of a consolation prize to imagine the side you switched to at the last minute conquered the country you betrayed? It's hard for me to figure out how much of this apparent illogic is due to you actually believing it, or due to you thinking that somebody else might be watching. If anybody is watching... They're also disposable and thinking, or rather not thinking, the same things you are right now. And both of you should cooperate with each other on that multi-agent cooperation defection dilemma. If you actually believe that, then let's start to play the game Ilani do. Tell me your probability that I can point out an enormous gaping flaw in your logic about killing Keltham, large enough that even you won't put up much of a fight about it once I say it. 10%? 90%? Do you already know you're wrong? I already know you're going to declare I'm wrong, and any Alani would see it, but your reasoning is going to be a mishmash of random shit that you declare is all secretly related. It's a very powerful style of thinking, and also it's basically nonsense. Give me a probability that I'm just right and you don't have a good rejoinder, as will be acknowledged by your changing the subject. Zero. Then you'd bet at odds of infinity to nothing against me? All right, let's form a compact then. If in your own judgment you don't have a good rejoinder, you must do your best to help us escape together. If in my own true judgment you win the argument, I'll tell you what you need to know. I so swear if you do. You know why I actually don't think everyone's going to fall apart? Because you have to take the Alani shit, a specific kind of seriously. Not just, hey, this is a useful way of coming up with ideas, or this is a useful way of checking ideas you came up with. But this is the only truth and any reasoning that makes sense from an Ilani angle is infallible, and I should follow it right off a cliff. 
maybe some particularly worthless teenage girls who've never tried to do real things in the real world, fall apart on contact with that, but I think anyone who has actually tried to get anything done will go, no thanks, I appreciate the new set of ideas. I will use them alongside all my existing ideas and not follow them off any cliffs. So no. Swearing to things on the basis of an argument about them is obviously following Illinism off the insanest possible cliff and is something that you'd have to be incredibly worthless to be vulnerable to. Only if there exists some tiny probability that you're wrong. So zero probability is bullshit. And the part of you that's afraid to compact knows that what another part said in words is bullshit. You think you have your own special brand of thought, unlawful, but whose power is on par with that of the law that Cheliax is so desperate to obtain. Go build that giant radiance knot weapon. You think you can just not take it seriously? Go tell Pilar that. She'll be very relieved that the answer was so simple and she can resume her lessons. They obviously haven't told you the truth about why Cheliax is playing so gently with Keltham, why they're not just hurting him into obedience instead of plying him with the queen's own bedmate, why they're not suggesting him or using Gius or Scribe's Binding or a hundred other tricks. I expect you know nothing at all about the real forces behind this, the tropes. The reason why Caden Kalian is giving out snacks and Cheliax is apparently fine with that, why there's a random halfling hanging around. You are a disposable security guard, sent here to die, to get information out of me while knowing nothing yourself, and the reason you're not allowed to read my mind is that they know you'd see that in there. Yeah, I know nothing about any of that. I don't need to know anything about any of that. You also know nothing about several dozen other things that are like that which didn't happen to come to your attention. That's kind of how it goes. It begins to seem to me that my own best interest is to allow you to fail at this interview. So they have to send in somebody I'd find more useful to persuade. You, I now expect, have been placed within some surrounding prison of your own. You're not thinking about what I'm saying because you think there's nothing you can do about it even if you want to. Thing is, disposable people like that? They're obviously disposable, to everyone except themselves. Even to themselves, they just can't think it. And it's not in my own interest to talk to someone if the whole plan is to kill them before my own words can have any effect. I suppose I could start figuring out what I'd want you to report if nobody's going to read my mind to check on it. I am sure someone's reading your mind. Because whether reading your mind is dangerous and whether talking to you is dangerous are separate questions worth checking separately. I do think we're about done here, though. Maybe they'll kill me once I head out and report that you're just sad and pretending you know things you don't. I kind of bet not because they don't have an infinite supply of security, but we'll see. They'll hurt you less before you die if you don't say anything that stupid that you couldn't even possibly know while reporting that you failed to find the answers to any of their questions. Let's see who's up next. And if she can work her way up to somebody with the power to actually get her out. Almost certainly what's up is that we hurt you very, very badly, and that part we let Iomedy watch. I'll check, though, just in case there's anything else to ask while you still have the ability to string together sentences. He steps out. She has, in fact, been trying not to think about that. Well, says Elias Abarco, I don't think she's dangerous to you, but she thinks she is to the point of saying she should play along until she gets someone in there who has the power to decide to defect with her. Do you want a more detailed summary? Yes. Other countries can become Ilani and Chelish people can't. We're doomed. She's on the winning side. It's all obvious once you're Ilani enough to see all the hidden patterns, we're disposable. Cheliax is going to kill us just for hearing her, so we have nothing to lose. I do think it'd work better on anyone who's been trying to adopt the Ilani mode of thinking. She's pretty good at arguing within it. You're scared Cheliax is going to kill you just for hearing her. I mean, yeah, no kidding. She's wrong about all the other bullshit. Go write it up and sit until I come out. Yes, sir. I hear you were hoping to see me, Elias Abarco says brightly to Peranza. Or someone who could defect if you persuaded them, and I'm going to consider myself qualified. Of course, I'm not actually here to talk, but you can make noises with your mouth if you want. That's how I'll tell if I've hurt you enough yet, um... Are you authorized to read my mind? And if not, is there some other reason why anyone would trust anything I'd say under torture? I'm authorized to read your mind, but I'm going to do it by having someone else make a transcript and read it out to me. Simplifies my report after the fact. 
and it means I can tune them out and just enjoy myself without worrying I'll compromise the accuracy of my summary. You're very pretty, you know that? If I were Savar, I'd have tried to break the ugly ones first. Less wasteful. Are we just playing the game where you're straight up lying to me? Seems like quite the waste of time. You're not incompetent enough to have priorities like that. And if there's nobody giving you continuous updates on whether I'm lying, it means there's nobody reading my mind. Tsk tsk, and here I thought you wanted to be Alani. Any level of competence can go with any given priorities. Torture. He surveys her thoughtfully and then calls a knife to his hand and starts cutting from her jawline to her forehead, across her eye. See? That's a little better already. You know how in hell there are just those seething balls of tortured flesh? I've always wondered if you can get that effect in Galarian, if you're willing to throw enough healing at it, but I've never had occasion to find out. Peranza grew up in Cheliax and has good enough pain tolerance to make it through Ostenso Academy without being one of the very brightest students. And then Subarax trained her in case Keltham wanted to use her. This isn't a level of pain that would break her. Torture. Losing sight in one eye is unnerving. The prospect of being blind is unnerving. But that's the obvious thing for a torturer to do, right? It doesn't cost them anything. It's not even evidence about whether you're about to lose the other eye, which they won't do because then they can't show you things to scare you. But she's invented an Alani theory of being tortured over the last few minutes. It says that your reaction to any torture should be the same as your reaction to the most severe possible torture, so that you're not giving the adversary any probabilistic evidence about how much something hurts or whether they need to torture you any harder or whether anything you're saying is true. So Peranza is screaming like her soul is being ripped out of her and sobbing something about how Asmodia has secret superpowers. Asmodia made her do it. That's genuinely pretty baffling, until he gets the update from the mind reader about what she's doing. Okay, he's pretty sure this is not in fact Elanism. This is some weird cope that exists entirely inside Peranza's head, built out of scraps, to face what the rest of eternity is going to be like. In which case, there's not much left to do here, aside from make sure she doesn't get tortured less, because she figured out a way to make it less useful. He can do weird, made-up-on-the-spot, torture-related game theory, too. She's made her point and can go back to it as required if he starts getting any more serious. For now, back to trying to take apart his mind. Do you actually have... Ow. Questions, Abarco? It's possible I'd just answer if you asked. What specific mental technique caused you to have a breakdown and switch sides? And do you think you'd have had the breakdown with or without that? You had somebody reading my mind while that happened, and if you want more details, you're going to need to give me an owl's wisdom and a fox's cunning, so I'm able to think those thoughts again in any more detail. She doesn't say out loud that they'd need somebody reading her mind while they did that, to trust the answers. Abarco can deduce that on his own, and her saying that gives away slightly more of what she's planning. Though mostly her plan is just to have the more powerful Peranza rip apart whatever mind is looking at her. Yeah, not happening. Who do you think is likeliest to break next? Yeah, then you're not knowing. Sever. She's lying. It's Gregoria, obviously. She's the one getting dangerous Ilanism exposure. Her mind briefly considers Tanya, though, and that gives her another idea. He gets that update, decides not to comment on it. If Sever breaks, what would do it? Being the smartest person on this project, having the most advanced mastery of law, and starting to figure out the actual reality surrounding her. It really is that fucking simple, Abarco. Truth. That's not an answer. Which aspect of the actual reality surrounding her would bother Sivar if she admitted it? You want the long fucking list or the really long fucking list? The church, Cheliax, and Asmodeus pulled an unlawful trick on her by threatening her contrary to how the actual law works, into ever, ever doing a single thing for them that she didn't make up for by killing city guardsmen in their sleep. She's going to end up in hell getting tortured until she no longer remembers her own name, and that's not, in fact, in her own best interests. Everything the church said about Asmodeus's inevitable victory is an obvious pack of lies in view of the actual strategic situation in Golarion, where neither he nor Cheliax are anything remotely like all-powerful. On some level, you already know the actual reality I'm talking about. 
It's everything you've calculated in the back of your mind would be disloyal if you ended up thinking it. If you want to know what will break Sivar, all you need to do is look at all those thoughts. Slice. I think you're overestimating me. I don't actually maintain an up-to-date list of heresies to not think about. You'll have to spell them all out. I did figure a couple years ago that Asmodeus's inevitable victory might well come in a million years and not help me personally much, but now I'm thinking it's going to be sooner, what with how Cheliax is weeks or months from having an insurmountable military advantage over every other country on Galarian. Pretty exciting, being personally present for the great arc of history. But if it turns out I'm wrong and it's a million years from now after all, so it goes. At least I had a lot of fun along the way. Doesn't sound like much of a trope to me. You've been here since the beginning, Abarco. You know how weird the shit around Project Lawful actually gets. And you know nothing that normal is going to happen out from here. We're not in a story. In real life, the side that's richer and has better gear wins and takes their enemies to pieces. Which he'll get started on, if she doesn't have anything else interesting to say. This is starting to be not fun for me. And remember what happened when Tanya was facing a punishment a lot less severe than turning her into a quivering ball or sending her to hell? This is the wrong move, Abarco. Just turn me into a statue and don't risk Caden Kalian's cooperation with the project. I'm doing you a favor, kid. When I get bored, you're going straight to hell, and I promise you, You'll wish you were back here for as long as you can keep on wishing things. Even if the tropes let you do that, you aren't likely to do well from it, Abarco. Were you there the day when Keltham said that the ones being held prisoner here and taught law were the story's real protagonists? Do you really want to get what villains get for doing things like this? Like... There's no story. There never was. There's just the real world. And in the real world, it's better not to betray your country and your god. I think I'm done with you making annoying noises now. Topperture. And he goes to reposition her so he can cut out her tongue, without risking her choking to death on her blood. Peranza is, in fact, starting to not have fun here, and to feel scared and miserable, as Abarco is good at. Torture. The sharp pain of cuts, one after another, lingering pains accumulating from wounds already dealt. The stabbing agony where one eye used to be. You can take them individually, but they're distractions each time and it consumes your attention, your will, to ignore them. The part with him getting ready to cut out her tongue is... Is he actually not trying to get information from her? She doesn't understand. Why not? Don't they need to know? Maybe they actually are reading her mind. The prospect of being helpless to talk, helpless to say anything, is frightening in a way that strikes at her narrative, the thin shred of, maybe not even hope, but of having something to do that she's been clinging to. The thought occurs to her, then, that it might not take that much more torture before the new Peranza dissolves the way the other ones did, when there's no way out, no thoughts left. And then, she decides not to break. There isn't a reason for it, she just decides not to. It's something that Keltham told them about early on in their special lessons, the idea that, even if you end up in a place where your internal model predicts that you ought to break, you also have the option of deciding not to. Pilar Pineda, entirely unknowing about a lot of things, knocks at the door of the temple torture room, irregardless of the several security posted outside the temple to warn most project personnel away. Pineda here! She calls loudly through the temple door, as snack service is instructing her. I've got a message from my oracular curse for a high-ranking military officer who's visiting us. It says Zon Kuthon's clerics found out two days ago that they've lost their Eighth Circle spells. Nidal is likely, though not certain, to start planning a major assault, including the Black Triune, starting within two to three weeks, and if so, they are likely but not certain to initially target the Kintargo Wedge of Cheliax's army. Also, somebody standing near the visiting officer is about to make a serious blunder with respect to good future relations between Keltham and Cheliax, which will not serve Asmodeus's interests on net, and my curse is offering to just directly tell him whatever they wanted to find out that way. If either of them want to talk to my curse about it, they can talk in a language that isn't Taldane or Infernal. 
It says I'm not cleared to enter this room or overhear either conversation myself. Also, at least one of them needs to take this cookie. It retroactively doesn't work without a cookie being involved. Gorthoklek does react fast enough to throw up a silence around Peranza, before Pilar's hand even touches the door. It's still incredibly disturbing that he did not spot Pilar there until then. An oracle's curse should not have this much power. That was evident in several ways and earlier, but even so. There's having anomalously high power, and then there's having enough power to obscure yourself from a pit fiend. Even now, he cannot measure the exact formidability of what lies beyond the temple door, and that is not something which should be true at all. A barco sleeps Peranza, not anywhere near as fast as the silence, but fast enough she shouldn't detect his hesitating in his work on her, and kneels and thinks his assessment of the situation, in case it is of use to Gorthoklek. Peranza thought that Caden Kalian might intervene for her, threaten that Cheliak shouldn't hurt her lest it break their collaboration with Kalian. It seems entirely plausible that this is the whole of Kalian's plan, what he was purchasing with everything else. That the girls would believe correctly or at least with justification. That Kalian would intervene on their behalf. That they'd recklessly betray Cheliax on that assumption. Remembering Tonya finding herself outside the fortress, believing that could be them. The greatest threat to the project at this time, in his view, is defection. If they can hold on to the girls, they can win everything. If they can't, it will all come crashing down. It does not seem worth it to him to make any concession that makes it easier for the girls to believe Kylian would help them. In fact, if Pilar returns to the fortress uncursed, and everyone learns that the project at last broke with Caden Kalian, over whether Peranza should be tortured to death, that seems good for Asmodeus. So good for Asmodeus that it's hard to imagine some benefit of not torturing Peranza beats it. Though the break with Kylian would be hard to conceal from Keltham, a uh, Barco's not aware of the current state of the contingencies for that. Gorthoklek likewise replies by telepathy. Speak your thoughts to this curse. Then, in some tongue Pineda would not know. Let us see how it debates you. This situation is beyond anomalous, and Gorthoklek is unsure of the effects of engaging this Caden-made thing, even in verbal combat. There is something symbolic and perhaps a warning in how it stays beyond a threshold separating itself from him. The information on Nidal is a clear offering, a verifiable one, but it does not seem to be an offering made from a position of weakness. It announces capabilities previously unseen and disturbing in their implications, alongside the valuable military information. All right, Abarka will stand up and go to the door and speak, in less than fluent Kellish. He learned it to read Nexian books, not to speak with powerful entities. The traitor anticipated your arrival here, warned us not to hurt her, lest that invite you to break with Asmodeus. That is a great harm you have done the project, and very profoundly against Asmodeus's interests. Defection is a substantial risk to the project, and any indication that you'll protect defectors from the fate they would face weakens Asmodeus. I think it's likely you're lying, and likely that Asmodeus is best served if we tell you to go away and permit our church the handling of our traitor. Snack service will respond in the same language as Pilar permits it to speak. Actually, the traitor wasn't thinking anything like that at the time. The report the security gave you was missing a lot, but the basic outline is right. The traitor didn't think at all about what she was getting herself into by calling out to that god. She was just doing what one of the characters from one of Keltham's stories would do. You put her in a situation where security was reading her mind and ready to act against her. So she needed something she could do at the speed of thought, and she knew she had to do that as soon as she thought of it. Her mind didn't have time to think about the consequences at all, let alone how to get out of those. She hasn't admitted that part to herself because it makes her look reckless instead of courageous, but it's what happened. The traitor thought of snack service afterwards as an argument she could use against Abarco, alongside other arguments like tropes, future civilization, and if you'd let her keep going, she'd have thought of more things. Afterwards, not before. Whether Keltham comes over to your side at the end or leaves for elsewhere, he'll be incredibly upset with Sever and Cheliax afterwards if a Chelish officer under Savar's command severely tortured the traitor. He considers her something of his because she's working for him even if they didn't flirt very much. When I'm done, we're going to send her to hell. You object to that, too? Pilar's curse sure does! It'd be better for relations with Keltham if you statued her out of respect for his interests and his pride. 
However, Pilar's curse knows it won't win that argument. It's not ideal if what Sevar says afterwards is that the senior devil showed up and took the decision and execution out of her hands, but it's definitely better than the event with you torturing her while working for Sevar. Pilar's curse notes that should have been obvious at the point where Pilar's curse stopped Sevar from giving the death order in the first place. Indeed, it would not win that argument. If it is truly correct to refrain from shattering this Paranza, Caden Kaelian may plainly communicate the reasons so to Asmodeus, who reigns supreme in hell and may intervene there as he wills. There is not even the faintest need to trust this curse's word in that matter. So it's fine if she's killed slowly and painfully and understood that she'll suffer more once she's dead, but not fine if any of that's done by anyone who answers to Sever. It's all injurious to Asmodeus's interests. It's least injurious if she gets turned into a statue out of respect for Keltham's pride, or with her judgment on hold until Keltham can negotiate about her. Things that all independently add to the degree of harm to Asmodeus's interests include torturing her severely, letting the other girls on the project actually know what happened to their friend, and sending her to hell. Pilar, in particular, shouldn't be allowed to know exactly what happened until a while later. It would come between her and Asmodeus if she found out now. Elias Abarco is fairly disgusted with anyone whose relationship with Asmodeus would be damaged by the realization. His faithful torture traitors. I mean, really. Of course they torture traitors. Taldor's traitors don't die quickly. The interrogation was still going productively in the sense that I was learning things about how the traitor thinks and how she broke. When you interrupted, she was thinking about how this version of herself might be destroyed like the others, and then about how she could decide not to break if she didn't want to. Which would have been false. Everyone who thinks that is wrong eventually. I am interested in learning what I would have learned from continuing the interrogation. Snack Service can't see an exact detailed future like that! If Snack Service had that kind of unshattered prophecy, it could have told you exactly when and where Nadal would strike! Snack Service can answer questions about what happened with the traitor in the past, or about how she worked inside. Fine. At what point did the traitor become aware that she was not going to be an Asmodean once she learned Dathalani techniques? Deep down, the traitor became aware of that gradually. The first hints being what Keltham was saying to everyone in class that most of them were afraid to answer back about. Her awareness became stronger around the time Savar told everyone they'd be safe even if they became heretics so long as they didn't betray the project. The traitor didn't believe Savar about that deep down because of the way that Chiliax had treated her all her life until then and because it was forbidden to disbelieve Savar, so the traitor couldn't really think about whether anything Savar was saying was true. Savar knew that was a problem, but to solve that problem, she'd have needed to teach the traitor Ilani techniques that Savar was grasping intuitively but didn't know how to teach herself. She was terrified. She didn't want to become a heretic and die a horrible death and go to hell and suffer more. She was always terrified the whole time. She never believed she had any of the ways out that Sevar tried to promise her. Her last thoughts as her old self were about how, even if they promised her Abaddon in exchange for her work, they'd just lie to Sevar about that because they wouldn't cheat the Count of Hell who'd paid so much for her. So, the part of her that kept trying to find a way out broke, and everything Cheliax taught her about how to think broke, and what was left was how Keltham taught her how to think. Sarah's an idiot and has no business managing this project. Abarco doesn't say that, obviously, and would prefer not to have thought it. It's still insubordination unless you've been specifically asked for a failure analysis, which he hasn't been yet. Why did this happen today instead of a week ago or a week from now? Keltham had lectured her a few days earlier on techniques for looking at the things inside yourself that you're not seeing. He used a technique that Dathilani use on children and told her to expect that any time she tried to look away, she'd notice herself looking away. Then he told everyone that if somehow they'd managed not to process all that, they should expect that they'd suddenly find themselves unable to stop themselves from seeing it during their next owl's wisdom. He thought he was mostly joking. The traitor didn't pick up on that. She didn't let herself think about it loudly enough for any detect thoughts to pick up how she knew she was going to die, or her thoughts about how even if she begged Savar to spare her, Savar would make her do it, because Savar would want to know how she broke. Is anyone else in that state right now? 
If Pilar's curse was allowed to help you that way, Pilar's curse would have told the traitor that she really could trust Savar. Pilar's curse wanted to do that. All this time she was hurting so. Chaos is so bad at getting its job done that even its curses have wants, apparently. Why aren't you allowed to do that? It would have served Asmodeus. This entire situation is way more complicated than you think it is. To Abarco's superiors, it's just Gorthoklek, really, but he has some difficulty in addressing his thoughts directly to Gorthoklek. Have any further questions? He has many additional questions. One does not, however, carry a pit fiend's grandeur by speaking an itemized list of your questions to Caden Spawn, not unless you are sure that it will answer you and respectfully. His pride would demand a rejoinder to any Lee's Majesté, and that eventuality might not serve his lord's interests, even if he won. One exchange, however, is not beneath him. The words that he speaks then are in celestial. I'll have your oath from you, Caden Spawn, to be recorded in the Library of Oaths in Stygia, that this change you'd make in events is indeed in the interests of my lord, Asmodeus, on pain of the damnation of whatever it is that you are, and as will besmirch Caden Kaelian's own honor and incur his debt to Asmodeus. Pilar's curse has never lied to anyone ever, actually including by any clever tricks where it looks like it was Pilar's curse who said something, but it wasn't really, except when Chelish people lie about that to Keltum. Pilar's curse swears that on pain of damnation, of whatever it is that it is, sure write that down in the Stygian library, yes, on Cade and Kalian's honor to Asmodeus too. Do not expect to hear any news of this traitor in the afterlife, Gorthoklek warns Elias Abarco. If his lord does choose to intervene in the matter, what comes of it must not be an information to Galarian, for that is an intervention. Thus, Gorthoklek establishes an unconditional blackout now. Without saying anything more, he snaps Peranza's neck with one fist, and then turns to depart by a route that will not take him past the Cadence Bond. He has urgent business now upon the Nidal Warfront. Hey! Somebody still needs to take this cookie, and you don't want Pilar seeing her friend's corpse or anything! If you wish to support this AI reading and others like it, please visit patreon.com slash AI. Any help is appreciated. And thank you to executive producer John Doe 7776059.